So uh, welcome to this next installment of FreeBSD Office Hours, where we try to answer questions from the community uh, and generally be more open project. Uh, so it looks like we have a first question came in from Gus, who asked, does FreeBSD support uh, asynchronous IO requests? Uh, so the answer is yes, it depends on the type you want to do. Uh, but in general, yeah, FreeBSD has support for AIO. Uh, so if you're using an application that wants to make asynchronous AIO, uh, IO requests, you can do that with the uh, AIO. Um, I was actually doing that earlier today using the FIO file system benchmark tool on some disks and using the POSIX AIO interface to be able to, you know, submit uh, 350,000 IOPS per second of, of requests. Uh, so yes, you can do that. Um, there's also support coming. Um, for asynchronous uh, data in, um, what do you call it there, uh, ZFS. So some work that happened at SpectraLogic in like 2012 or something, um, specifically when you have ZFS with a larger record size uh, and you modify a smaller part of the record, you end up having to wait so you can read in the block, modify that chunk of it and write it out again uh and that can block up the the read and write pipeline uh so spectrologic wrote some code so that zfs would be able to go off into the background to read in the data it needed to modify um to update that record so it's called async dmu uh and that work is finally going into upstream open zfs and uh hopefully will be part of freebsd 13. so that will improve the performance of uh ZFS when you're doing sub block updates um, by rather a large margin uh, from the testing I've seen from IX systems and, and the, the people that used to work at Spectrologics that are upstreaming it. Uh, so Ed, I guess, asked me to talk a little bit more about uh, the 350,000 IOPS tests I was doing. Uh, so working on an article for uh, my website um, about performance tuning for ZFS. Uh, and as part of that, needed to know how much the SSDs could do before you start putting them in ZFS. So basically just the raw disks. Uh, so I was using FIO and the POSIX AIO interface to do asynchronous IO and trying to submit enough work to each disk to actually get you know, the performance the disk says on the box that it will give. Uh, and so in my test machine, which is a Xeon Silver 4114, which I think is 10 cores at 2 point something gigahertz, uh, plus hyper-threading, um, with that, uh, and it was, I was getting slightly strange results. Was, I, I, I would start the test and I would see good IOPS um, and then it would slow down to a, a much slower rate. Uh, and then when I looked at the console, I saw that I was actually hitting the uh, interrupt storm uh, prevention code, uh, which is uh, a feature of FreeBSD that deals with, uh, sometimes there'd be a network interface or some other PCI device that would cause an interrupt storm where it would actually be constantly sending interrupts uh, to the point where it might soak up all of the available CPU and stop the machine from being able to boot or do anything. Um, it's actually saved me in the past with a busted USB controller and a busted Ethernet controller, uh, you know, rate limiting the interrupts from those devices. Uh, but in this case, I was causing too many interrupts from the SATA controller, uh, and that was causing the operating system to rate limit the interrupts out of that, and it was limiting how much performance I could get uh, out of the individual disks. And so I did some tuning to disable that. And upon further investigation, found that in FreeBSD 13, it's already been disabled by somebody else. <laughs> uh, but with that, I was able to get 
about the performance that it says on the box, 95,000 or so IOPS out of each of the SSDs uh, for random reads. Um, I haven't tested all the different aspects yet. I don't want to wear out the disks just while I'm testing. Um, but when I use all four disks at once, I'm starting to run into limitations, I think, of the controller where you just can't handle that much traffic. So after about, uh, on large blocks, about 1.5 or 1.6 gigabytes per second, uh, I think the SATA controller is hitting about the, uh, the limit of what it can do. Uh, and then when I was using smaller blocks is when I started running into the, the interrupt limiting. And that's when I uh, did some tuning and managed to turn the interrupt limiting off. Uh, and that allowed me to get to about 350,000 IOPS out of the four SSDs uh, when reading from all of them randomly continuously with a high enough QDEF to keep them all busy. Uh, so Gus has a follow-up question uh, saying, for a beginning developer interested in contributing to FreeBSD with code, where do you suggest to start from? I would suggest where the bit of the operating system you're most interested in or the bit that's giving you the most trouble. Um, as with pretty much any open source project, it turns out that your motivation is the biggest thing. And so working on something that interests you results in much greater success than uh, working on where maybe it's most needed uh, because, you know, when you're not interested in it, it's hard to motivate yourself to spend your limited free time on it. I think for for all of us that's working on FreeBSD in some sense, regardless of where in the system we're working, source ports and documentation, we, we started by fixing something that, that annoyed us or something that we needed to get done or something that seemed fun. So yeah, as, as Alan said, start with something you find interesting and that, that scratches your itch, so to speak. Yeah. Um, other things I've, I've done in the past have mostly been around uh, something I, I wanted to work or, you know, something I was working on when I was working on uh, ZFS boot environments and making and improving those in the installer and so on. But then it didn't work well if you wanted to encrypt your disks. And so I spent a bunch of time making the disk encryption stuff work, even though I don't actually use that. But again, it was mostly to scratch my head to make this work this way for everyone uh, so that I don't have to special case it as much. <laughs> Uh, so Gus has a, another follow-up question saying, is there some tutorial to help beginners set things up in order to compile FreeBSD's code? Is there any step-by-step -step tutorials to do that? Um, there is the instructions in the FreeBSD handbook. They're slightly more geared towards a sysmin who wants to compile a different version of FreeBSD uh, and install it. But that is the same thing for development, although uh, we maybe could have some documentation that was a little more uh, about development that maybe talked about how to set things up a little differently. Like, you know, if you're doing development, you're probably not wanting to do it out of user source. You probably want it in your home directory somewhere. And even just some of the the little things like being able to set where the objector goes and uh, some of the things like that, that can uh, improve the experience of, you know, doing your first changes to FreeBSD. So a tutorial that actually involved, you know, check out the FreeBSD source code and change something small. I don't know what it might be, uh, but some little thing and then compiling uh, and then being able to see your change happen uh, could be a good starter tutorial for that. Yeah, I think, Alan, that's a, um, a, that would be a great thing. I don't know if we want to do it in a, one of these office hours or FreeBSD Fridays or um, what venue, but I think a, um, you know, you or me, or maybe we can talk John Baldwin into doing it. Basically, just um, I don't know, find a find a PR uh, that's a, got a simple fix in it or something, and just walk through the whole um, process from beginning to end, showing how we um, how we would apply the change and try it out and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Check out the source tree. Uh, grab a patch from a PR or something. Uh, apply it. Build that. Do the testing. Uh, and, and show kind of that whole process. Uh, or even uh, outside of a PR doing it, you know, 
I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example of a, one of the little user space programs where you could change something cosmetic uh, and then just be able to see that as a result and then show how you would uh, go about submitting that patch back uh, as well. So one or both of those would be uh, really helpful, I think. Uh, another interesting one might be, um, I know Steve Wills has talked about this before, but showing how to configure something like VirtualBox so that if your uh, the operating system you're running on your computer is not FreeBSD, being able to have your FreeBSD VM with the source code in it, but have that directory shared. So on your host VM, whether that's Windows or Mac or whatever, uh, you could do, you know, run your favorite text editor and do all the, the work on your computer, but being able to compile FreeBSD in the VM and, and run the code you've changed. Yeah, I think we talked about doing that for something like Google Summer of Code, where the student wants to, to work on FreeBSD, but maybe doesn't have a dedicated computer for FreeBSD. I think the hardest part of doing that kind of new developer documentation is trying to find the right level of the, of the tribal knowledge to share. You know, it's like, do we, do we teach them about, you know, dash D no clean and, and, you know, setting in the environment variables that move the obstacle and stuff. And, and how much of that do we get into and how much do we uh, avoid uh, confusing them with? Yeah. My take on that is um, uh, that if there is some sort of setting that is universally used by the FreeBSD developer community, but isn't documented and no one else knows about, um, we've we failed somehow. Um, yeah. Like in particular, no clean. Um, you know, I think it's a relic from um, very early build systems that couldn't track dependencies particularly well. Um, and in my so in my my working tree, I've had um, no clean uh, as the default um, option. For a couple of years, and you know, have, there's occasional hacks that we have to deal with for um, places where the dependencies don't work. But really, we should um, we should either fix the, those kinds of things where we where all the develop FreeBSD developers know there's some kind of workaround that needs to be applied, um, or just say, yeah, this is is what you have to do. I, I understand definitely where you're coming from, and you know, it's it's also kind of problematic to document some of those because. Um, if by their nature they're hacks, then we might well fix them. And then people have all this documentation that talks about workarounds and hacks that don't apply anymore. And that's also yeah. annoying. Right. And you don't want to have to spend too much time explaining, you know, these kind of esoteric options when, you know, you don't necessarily need them. I think if, if we're starting with changing small user land utilities, usually you can build just those utilities, you don't have to do build world from the top and perhaps we don't need to do the no clean stuff from the, from the very beginning. Yeah, that works, except for when it doesn't. <laughs> yep. Uh, which is, you know, it might be better for the documentation to do the, the full build world, but, you know, on a laptop that takes long enough that maybe it's not worth it. Uh, so another user asked, uh, what are the plans for merging OpenZFS into FreeBSD? Uh, so there's a call for testing on the mailing list now if you want to try it out. Uh, it's relatively simple instructions to apply it and try it out. Um, and I imagine the plan is likely sometime in August. Uh, based on the OpenZFS leadership meeting, which was yesterday, uh, the plan is to actually branch off OpenZFS 2.0 uh, sometime in August, probably about the third week in August, um, and you know, start stabilizing that branch. Uh, and so that will also mean that uh, the, the version of OpenZFS we're going to pull into FreeBSD will stop being a moving target and uh, will be basically a, a stable branch over there uh, where they're only going to pull in bug fixes and so on and, and basically uh, stop pulling in new features so that development of OpenZFS can continue in the the trunk branch, but uh, 
what will be OpenZFS 2.0, which is what will ship as part of FreeBSD 13, uh, will stop changing so much. Do you, uh, do you know, Alan, if there's outstanding things that we're, we're waiting on to, to integrate into OpenZFS before, or, or like known issues that we need to address for before the um, merge? There's a few features that are in FreeBSD now that aren't in OpenZFS that we're trying to upstream. Uh, and, you know, just the rest of the FreeBSD stability stuff. Uh, but I don't think there are, there are no major features we're waiting on anymore. Okay. Uh, there's there's some hope to get Z standard finish in time, uh, but beyond that, there's it's mostly just making sure all the FreeBSD fixes and everything uh, are in and ready to go, and you know actually finishing uh, a broader round of testing and and getting everything good for what will be the first uh, really major release of OpenZFS. Uh, I see there's a uh, question about the Git uh, transition as well. Um, we have a office hours coming up specifically for focusing on the, the Git transition, but um, uh, we're iterating right now on the, the SVN to Git converter itself. Um, the converter in the past didn't understand merge info and um, was uh, made a usable Git conversion, but it was missing uh, merges for a lot of old vendor uh, vendor updates and, and things like that. So uh, Ulrich uh, UQS at, at FreeBSD um, has been working on fixing up the the limitations in that. Uh, we're, we've, we've had a, the Git converter I think has been in a pretty good state for the last um, couple of weeks. What we've been doing now is every two weeks uh, spinning the, the hash is basically restarting the conversion from scratch um, to pick up whatever changes he's made to the converter itself uh, if necessary. So it, it may well be um, that, you know, we're, we're happy with the state of things and it doesn't change, but uh, we're working on a two week cadence. So last Sunday was, was the last uh, update. And then um, every two weeks, if we have updates to the converter, then they'll they'll come in. Um, we've been spending a bunch of effort on working on the workflow documentation for vendor code updates. So the way that we manage third-party contributed code in Subversion today, um, we're gonna follow largely the same approach, but the the, the kind of low-level details um, are, are rather different. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, our, our top level approach um, from a developer's perspective is going to remain unchanged. So FreeBSD will still be a monorepo with the tool chain integrated and libc and the kernel and everything all in the same, the same repo. Uh, when you clone it from a Git repository, it will, um, everything will still come as one, um, one update. There's uh, we won't be using sub modules, for example, for the for LLVM or, or those sorts of things. Um, at least, uh, you know, our, our initial goal, our, our phase one conversion is basically to translate our current workflow into a Git model. Uh, we may well look at things once uh, once the migration is done, but currently none of that is that is in scope. Um, the uh, you can join the FreeBSD dash Git mailing list or look at the archives for information on the conversion as it's happened so far and, and the location of the repo and such. Um, and I, I definitely encourage folks who have an interest to try cloning the, uh, the beta conversion and try building from it, try submitting a patch uh, or, or developing work um, against that, that beta workflow or beta repository and re definitely report any issues if, if there are um, if you see any while you're working on it. 
so that we can make sure that it's all addressed before um, before we migrate for good. Uh, WSEN asks uh, about how to see what audio devices and Bluetooth devices, et cetera, are on their laptop from the command line. So yeah, to to see at least if a driver is attached, uh, there's another tip to just do cat slash dev slash snd stat to get the list of the current uh, audio devices that are are detected. Yeah, I didn't actually know about that one. Because <laughs> yeah, I was thinking it's like well, there's the sysctl dev.pcm tree that talks a bit about audio devices and you know pci conf and usb control and so on yeah. but i don't even know what to do for bluetooth i've never tried to use bluetooth yeah the dev uh, slash dev slash soundstat is is a bit of a departure from the way that um we normally report this kind of information in freebsd um but uh, yeah, that's that's where um, where all the devices uh, show up. I um, I worked with um, uh, the developer who submitted audio uh, OSS uh, support for uh, OBS for FreeBSD, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I discovered uh, discovered it. Um, adding uh, basically parsing it. To find the device names to report in the the dropdown, um, so that that is the canonical way to to find the find devices. Uh, and then Gus asks another question. He says, I know that FreeBSD has support for threads and processes for applications to spawn uh, and so on. Uh, but if I use a node.js uh, application on FreeBSD, does it have support for async IO concurrency model? I don't actually know what uh, methods node.js will try to use to do asynchronous IO and if it supports any of the ones that FreeBSD provides or not. Node.js, it works on FreeBSD. There is support for it, but yeah, I don't know either if we, uh, which, which concurrency models, if any, it supports. Uh, your best bet is probably to try it and see. <laughs> yep. Um, and, uh, Netchild, what's his actual name? Alexander Lightinger. Uh, follow up in the chat room uh, that if you set the sysctl hw.snd.verbose equals two, then the uh, devs snd stat output uh, is much, much more verbose and talks about uh, the volume uh, and a bunch of other the settings for each of the devices as well. Mm. There is another reply that node uh, node uses lib libuv, uh, I guess for for concurrency. Uh, so I guess a question for Ed: After moving to Git, are there plans to move to a better model for submitting patches? I guess you kind of already talked about this, but yeah, I mean it's a great question. Um, I think. Uh... The short answer is that with the phase one conversion, 
um, our workflow isn't going to change. So we're we're not going to migrate entirely to um, you know doing everything via pull requests on um, GitHub, for example. Um, we do currently sometimes accept pull requests, um, or sometimes pull requests opened against the, the current GitHub mirror make it into FreeBSD um, by virtue of a single uh, or an individual developer uh, taking that patch out of the pull request, applying it to the subversion tree, and then committing it. Um, one of the things that will happen with the Git transition is, if nothing else, it will be much easier for um for individual developers to merge pull requests in um, and one of the benefits um of moving to git as well is that we'll be able to maintain proper uh, authorship information for submitted work um, so currently anytime someone submits a patch uh, you know the the history shows it recorded as being committed by whichever developer adopted the patch uh, and it, it it says you know we, we have metadata in the commit message itself that says submitted by which wh whoever um, submitted it but it, it will be nice for us to be able to uh, to properly attribute changes to whoever initially uh, created them um, the the second part of the question was about um, pre-commit uh, CI and, and such um, for pull requests, and that is definitely something that um, we also are are looking to support. We can certainly do a lot of that independent of the migration to Git. Uh, for example, um, uh, Lee Wen uh, has been working on supporting that out of Fabricator. Um, so you know we could we absolutely could build and test patches that are um, are open in as fabricator uh, reviews. Um, one of the nice things about moving to Git is that there are a lot of third party services as well that um, can make that can can automate a lot of that and uh, augment whatever we're doing for CI in FreeBSD directly. Um, so for example, my working tree uh, for all the development I do, um, I share it on, um, I share that tree on GitHub and Cirrus CI um, notices when I push new changes there and it does a build and smoke test uh, automatically. So it, it, it builds FreeBSD uh, kernel and user land and then does a, a test boot inside of QMU just to make sure that it actually comes up and, and um, gets as far as the, the kernel passing off um, uh, control to user land and then just shuts down and says, yeah, it was, you know, it, it, it at least has some minimal level of functionality. Um, and so we can do at least that level of, of testing basically on any submitted patch um, in a Git model entirely using using provided services. Uh, kind of slightly related question. Uh, has the Git working group or sec team uh, looked at the FreeBSD update in a Git world yet? Uh, so it is definitely on um, uh, on sec teams uh, radar. Um, I think the the short answer is that um, you know there will be a um, a small transition to deal with. Um, uh, where the um, uh, where the source is obtained from, but the way that the FreeBSD update system works is actually not particularly um, tied into the revision control system today. Um, so the the um, the changes that go in um, changes that go into a security advisory um, update or an errata update. Um, and they get committed to the release branches in Subversion. They they both originate from um, a patch uh, file in the Sec Team repository. So actually, it, it doesn't. It's not a extensive change um, to do the same model in Git. One of the things, though, is that the transition to Git means we'll be able to greatly improve the workflow for security patches because all of the work for staging um, the the 
the patch for to address the errata or security issue um, can be done ahead of time um, and then just published, um, just made public at the time that the advisory is released. So I think the the transition to Git is going to greatly simplify um, uh, or allow for a greatly simplified workflow for for Sub team. I have a follow up as well for that. Has there been any anyone looking at Merge Master in Etsy update and stuff like that? At least Merge Master, I think, uses the SVN revisions fairly a lot. Yeah, Merge Master is definitely on the um, list of uh, issues to be addressed. Problem yeah. children? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the biggest problem with merge master goes away when we stop having the BCS ID tags, although it won't be able to assume just because the, you know, the dollar FreeBSD tag is the same that the file is the same origin. So it might actually be more of a problem instead of less. Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally, um, attempting to do a two way merge um, based on uh, VCS tag embedded in the file itself is, is just fundamentally not really a workable solution. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, I might argue that um, if that doesn't work after the transition, it was already broken. Um, but it is it is definitely a um, it, something that um, is uh, is being tracked. Warner points out in uh, the the chat here that both will work, um, uh, both will continue to work. And I think, um, I, I guess, depending on how you define work, um, that, that is true. Yeah. But uh, Warner's point is that neither one of them um, actually interacts with the repo per se. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't check out uh, from uh, revision control. Um, so that uh, what what the source of the um, the file is is uh, whether the file is coming from SVN or Git um, uh, shouldn't matter. Yep. Um, the that that is independent of the dollar free BSD tags, um, which will or won't change um, depending on whether it's subversion or Git. Yes, for some definition of work. <laughs> so another question that scrolled by was, I created a service to monitor laptop battery and put the monitor script in users slash user slash SBIN and the service in the slash etc slash rc.d both with 0555 root wheel permissions. Is this the is this the canonical or should I put this elsewhere? Uh, so that will work. Uh, and, but as I mentioned on IRC there, um, according to the hierarchy man page, uh, you know, the idea is that the stuff that's in user SBIN and, and so on is the operating system and changes you make locally would be in the, with the prefix user local. So that's why you have user local SBIN and that's also where FreeBSD defaults to putting uh, ports and packages that you install, because again, those are basically local modifications that you've added separate from the operating system. And that separation is what uh, makes upgrading on FreeBSD a much smoother process because you can upgrade the operating system or the packages independent of each other because they're not kind of intermingled. Uh, but for your local change, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, just the advantage of putting it in user local is that uh, it's easier to tell what's separate from the operating system. And you know, scripts like Merge Master aren't going to be like, hey, I found this weird file in etcrc.d that's not in the manifest. Do you want me to clean it up for you or something? Uh, and then you know, depending on how you upgrade, uh, you, know, you wouldn't want that file to get left uh, in the wrong spot or cleaned up or something.
a delay on the live stream often results in <laughs> a little bit of a lag between when we answer a question and when, when people actually hear the answer. Uh, there's a bit more of a conversation on IRC going on about the asynchronous IO uh, and Node.js and so on. Uh, in the end, it mostly comes down to, you know, is your application underperforming or is it working fine? And maybe uh, you don't need to worry about uh, how much support uh, LibUV has for using AIO as opposed to just KQ uh, and an event loop if, you know, you're not going to be doing uh, requests on a scale that uh, it's going to make a difference. So Nicholas asks, what's stopping Merge Master from being retired? I think mostly just the fact that a lot of people are still using it. <laughs> but, you know, if the plan is to get rid of it, we probably want to start giving people notice sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I would I would tend to concur that I think it's, it's largely inertia um, and possibly um, documentation or lack thereof um, about better options. Um, I think basically uh, at this point, um, you're much better off using Etsy update than, than Merge Master. Yeah. Um, sometimes find ETC update uh, expects you to be in a slightly more, not necessarily developer mindset, but it kind of assumes you understand how SVN handles merge conflicts and the fact that it's doing the same ish thing. Mm. Uh, so the question I had is does ECC update have a mode like merge masters dash P for things you need to do before you can uh, install kernel or whatever, like just creating the missing users and stuff, but not necessarily merging everything, just the preconditions? Yes, it does. In... I can't remember on top of my head the exact option, but I am reasonably sure that it has. It, I'm I'm scrolling through the uh, through the manual as you speak. Yeah, it's dash p. It's the same same flag as for for merge master. It's dash p dash dash p, uh, which enables pre world mode, which only merge files that are ne necessary for for us. Uh, successful uh, make install world. Right, yes, because you know it tries to CHO in certain files to users that maybe don't exist on your system yet because uh, you're just upgrading. Um, I think fundamentally, Alan, I don't know what answer I would have to the comment about it kind of being developer focused and presenting merge conflicts in the way that SVN does. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally, that's kind of inherent in um, three-way merge re resolution. General. Like anytime you have a source file and two derivatives that have both changed the same set of lines in different ways, like it, 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 the problem exists regardless, you can't really paper it over. Um, mm -hmm. I, so personally, um, when I'm doing a development in Git, um, I have, uh, I use kdiff3 as my three-way merge um, tool, which um, basically shows you a four-pane graphical um, view. So you see the original file, um, you see the changes that were uh, made by the other source, and then you see the changes that you made, uh, and then the window at the bottom shows the, the merge result. And so anytime there's no conflicts, you know, it tries to do the right thing and just say, if, if um, 
version B or version C made a change that doesn't conflict with the other of C or B, if the change gets applied directly. Otherwise, it says there's a merge conflict, and then you can pick lines from one or the other or both or just, just edit it um, directly. Uh, and I'm not sure if Etsy update um, supports that, uh, supports invoking a, a three-way merge tool directly or not. Um, if it doesn't, that's something we should we should definitely look at, at adding. So anyone, if you're running it in, um, uh, if you're running it in X, if display is set, then we could you allow the user to set a, a three-way merge tool, a graphical three-way merge tool and have that come up. Um, other than that, I don't, I don't know what else um, we could really do to kind of simplify um, merge conflict resolution. Well, I think mostly if we could get our config files so that people don't edit the file that gets updated. Well, right. absolutely, yes, absolutely. That uh, um, it, it should be a rare situation that ever comes up. Um, ideally, not at all. <laughs> yeah, and we've started to get that way, like the, the default cron tab file having includes and, and moving stuff out right. there so that people aren't editing the file that where the defaults might change because we add something. But I know like new syslog was a problem for that for a while. Uh, and the include support there helped with that. Um, but yes, getting more of the files so that we separate the defaults uh, from the user settings so that mm -hmm. you know when the OS is being updated, we're not changing a file the user ever edited. Uh, and then that will reduce the frequency of occurrences of, of the issue to have to deal with merge conflicts in the first place. I wonder if we have a good way of finding out what, um, what conflicts um, people are generally having to address um, with a, um, mm -hmm. what sort of three-way merge conflicts people are actually running into. The most common one for me is definitely the password file, obviously, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know there's much to be done about that. Uh, um, beyond that. So, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, for cases like the password file, um, that's something we, you know, we, we should be able to address in a domain specific manner that, um, the uh like really if um we should be able to create a tool um that can look at the three um three iterations and as long as you're not using the same new id locally and in a an update that came from the the original one um you know that can that can always be addressed programmatically um so if if a user assigned a um, a local uh, new UID, and there it, it's on a conflicting line with an upstream update. Um, you know that will that's certainly something that would be punted to a three-way merge tool if you're just doing if you're if you're doing kind of a um, a file um, uh, format unaware merge. But it's something that a, some some special tooling should absolutely be able to to address. Um, I, I also uh, I'll put a little plug in here. I hope that uh, now that we have um, uh, Lua available in the base system, that tools like that you know we could easily create um, and do a um, you know do slightly more advanced um, uh, tools like that that we wouldn't really want to do in shell script um, and that maybe someone. Uh, you know, certainly you could do it in C as well, but um, but maybe um, uh, maybe someone would would be interested in doing it in Lua instead. Yeah, like I can see if we've, uh, for example, look, going back to our uh, earlier debugging of SSH or whatever, uh, if we were to ch change the default logging class of the root user from blank to root uh, in the password file. Then uh, you know your typical three-way merge uh, tool would want to apply that update and end up removing the password you have on the root user, mm -hmm. whereas the the Lua script would be able to look at the differences and be like, oh, the thing that's actually changing here is the logging class. Do you want us to update root's logging class uh, to the new default, or you know, uh, it could also first look to see whether you've changed away from you know that specific field away from the default or not. Uh, and do a lot smarter things with it than you can with just you know your typical three-way merge tool. But yeah, it'd be interesting to compile a list of like you know the ten most common files that people run into merge conflicts with uh, during system upgrades and see you know 
maybe uh, for the password files, uh, a domain specific tool makes sense. And then for certain other files, it's like, well, we should have a better system for separating the defaults from the user settings and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I've, I've wanted to convert new syslog.conf to UCL specifically to do things like while by default we bzip to all the or I think xzip all the log files now. Um, I'm using ZFS, so I do, I'm, I'm going to have transparent compression, so I don't want new syslog to uh, compress any of my log files because they're compressed as they're written. So, you know, reading them, decompressing them, and recompressing them harder is not really something I need to spend time doing. Uh, but you know, if I edit every line of new syslog.conf to change all the defaults, then I'm going to have a merge conflict every time I upgrade. Whereas if we had a, a config file where I could, uh, you know, override the default without actually editing the default file, that would provide more flexibility. I saw a question uh, scrolling by about um, support for languages um, such as Erlang. Um, and it was answered in in there that yes, there is support. Um, but I think Erlang is specifically is an interesting one um, because um, that was a um, uh, WhatsApp uh, before being acquired was um, a, a you know there's lots of articles around talking about um, how FreeBSD and Erlang um, allowed them to uh, to scale to to um, I think you know, there's an article. It's like concurrent open sockets. Yeah, but but also just and and with relatively few engineers and few um, yes. few servers and 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 such. Um, you know, they they managed to to get incredible scalability um, out of FreeBSD and and Erlang. Um, so so certainly, yeah, Erlang um, you know has been used in uh, in production for extremely high uh, workloads on on FreeBSD. Yeah, those articles were interesting, especially uh, back then comparing to Twitter, which was about the same user base at the time, uh, and, and seeing that the, the WhatsApp team was able to do it with FreeBSD with 10 times fewer sysadmins. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was also a question about uh, using ZFS on smaller machines that maybe only have one disk uh, and how to back those up. Um, well, you can create uh, any type of backup you would with the uh, other file systems. There is some advantage in backing up the contents of a snapshot rather than the live file system, because it means, you know, with uh, a regular backup, if you're going through each of your files and backing them up one by one, it means that the first file you back up and the last file you back up are from drastically different times basically however long the backup took. Whereas if you back up the contents of a snapshot, uh, all of the files are from the, the same second or microsecond even, the same exact point in time. Um, and that can give you a higher quality backup with a typical tool, whether that's you know Bacula or Tar or whatever. Uh, and then yes, yeah, so you can use things like uh, ZFS replication. So you can ZFS send uh, snapshots that you've created to another machine uh, to be able to send them back later, or even just you know grab the contents from that machine off the other machine. Uh, and then yes, there was talk of of services like Tarsnap that allow you to back up stuff to the cloud uh, or whatever. But however you would normally do a backup on any other system is probably the same, uh, other than dump and ZFS send is basically uh, ZFS's version of of dump. And. Also for for ZFS, um, even if you only have one disk, uh, such as on a laptop or a desktop, it's it's for sure worth using it. Uh, it snapshots for backups and for just being able to roll back the system if you something happens. File system integrity, even if you might not be able to uh, restore Repair your it. files, just having knowing that you're broken and being able to restore them from backups if you have them is, is worth a lot. Yeah, uh, and as uh, Alexander pointed out in the chat room, uh, for doing incrementals, using something like ZFS uh, can be literally a thousand times faster than using something like rsync or a typical backup tool because you don't have to examine every file. ZFS actually knows, you know, if you ask it, give me the range of blocks that 
uh, changed between this time and this time, we can do that uh, basically instantly uh, and you know saturate whatever bandwidth you have uh, to what you're feeding ZFS send into. Whereas rsync has to look at every file, even the ones that didn't change, and check the, you know, the modification date of the file, maybe even run a checksum on it, and then has to do the same thing on the other side to figure out which blocks changed so we can send those differences, where ZFS already knows this because of the, the structure of the data on disk. Uh, and it can uh, save a lot of time, especially when updating systems with a lot of small files. You know, for example, I have my development server here that I use, but before I go to a conference, which used to be a thing that I did, uh, <laughs> I would replicate that to my laptop. Uh, and you know, I have something like 60 different SVN checkouts in there, <laughs> mostly ZFS clones, so they save, uh, they save a lot of space. But uh, trying to synchronize those changes with something like rsync would take an extremely long time, whereas just pulling up a month of updates uh, from my file server to my laptop only takes uh, a couple of seconds. And it's also reversible. So, you know, I did a bunch of work while I was at the conference or on the plane or whatever. And then when I get home, I can just replicate that back to my file server. And also just migrating from, from an older laptop or a new laptop or an older computer to a newer computer, you can just send the whole computer over. Uh, and then Ryan asks if we can make UTF-8 the default character set. Yes, yes, we should. But can we? <laughs> yes, we can. OK. So why haven't we? Uh, I think for the same reason that um, Merge Master is still around. Uh, as as Warner um, uh, posted in the chat a little while ago in all caps, uh, uh, fear of complaints. You know, if the thing people are complaining about in FreeBSD is that small, I think we've uh, accomplished a lot. <laughs> um, one, um, so I... I guess for questions like this for defaults, right, there's always uh, a few different takes on it um, in that I think um, I think that UTF-8 should be our default, you know, end of story. There's no, I don't even think there's much question about that. Um, but uh, one of the challenges is that the, um, you know, what, it's not particularly easy to set it to be, um, uh, UTF-8, but not specify a locale as well. Um, so uh, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if it's Debian that started this, but um, they use C.UTF-8 instead of, for example, EN underscore CA.UTF-8 or whatever. Um, it would be nice if our installer would choose a default for you or allow you to, 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 to set your default um, when you're when you're installing, if you are so inclined, um, we obviously don't want to have the system-wide default. You know, if you don't pick anything, be enus.utf8. Like that's not right. Um, no, it would definitely but, be ENCA, right? <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, but if if we're able to do the the c.utf8, um, that seems like a uh, to me that seems like a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Warner also pointed out that we might want to be careful, like uh, I think setting a default based on the installer, so new installs get it, uh, is much safer than say just changing the default in login.conf uh, because we don't necessarily want to change it on people who upgrade because of the fact that it can change the order of sort and, and things are like, I think switching it might actually like break Postgres or something. Uh, yeah. Change locales unexpectedly. Well, and this is this is another um, very good point that kind of goes back to our earlier upgrade discussion, um, and it's always a challenge for whenever the topic of changing defaults comes up because um, yeah, we don't want um, uh, we don't want to break sy people's systems behind their back on them um, during an upgrade by having things 
um, change in strange ways. Um, you know, I think really, um, on the other hand, I'm not a fan of having all of these things get set as defaults in the installer. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really like the idea of, of the, the installer is where all the knowledge of defaults um, uh, exi- lives. And mm-hmm. when you do a new install, you've got, you know, 30 or 40 settings that are the defaults, but not actually the defaults compiled into the kernel or, or wherever they are. Um, what I really would like is for, you know, we were talking about um, uh, domain specific tooling, for example, for updating uh, the password file. And I would really like it if we were able to address these sorts of things for upgrades in that way so that, uh, you know, the the upgrade tooling can say, oh, I know I need to add, you know, for example, the NTP user. That was one that um, came up a while back. We needed a new user for the, for NTP. And I would really like it if the installer could, uh, you know, apply changes like that, um, but not change user settings or or inform the user you know the inform the user the the um uh system log the, the default login class for root is now this would you like to apply it or you know the the, the default is now c.utf8 would you like to make this change um and have the install pro or the upgrade process not change those things um on on existing installations yeah so some kind of format to basically teach ETC update to interactively ask people about uh, those changes, but not apply them by default or something. Yeah, yeah, and and have a um, have options for listing um, listing the things that have changed and um, automatically apply all the changes or apply none of the changes or or ask interactively or whatever the case may something be. Something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yes, uh, so I think that's our time. So thanks everyone for coming, especially those that were uh, here to ask questions, uh, because you know that's what makes this office hours thing work is when people have uh, questions that we can answer. Uh, so uh, thank you all, and we'll uh, remember to keep an eye on the office hours wiki page uh, for when the next session is scheduled. I think the next one uh, will actually be about the Git transition. So uh, save up all your questions for that.